so just just a, a couple of announcements first um so th this as i mentioned is our 10th virtual presentation um and is a, a bit of a virtual tour of the computer history museum in silicon valley california um our next presentation will be on the 12th of May, and this is another virtual tour of the Port Talbot Tata Steel site. Uh, this is a joint IET presentation with South Wales East Branch. Um, and with so many people working and learning remotely, this pre presentation will give you the opportunity to experience a visit to a work in steelworks to uncover the technology used to optimize the business in, in what is a very competitive industry and in fact as you'll see when you see the presentation the very technical industry now um, using video 3d images 3d models you can experience a huge and exciting business usually only seen by insiders once you experience the blast furnaces steel making plants rolling mills we'll then share some of the exciting technology from the internet of things to cloud analytics that drives continuous improvements so that's uh, a, a presentation. It's not on our site just yet because we're just waiting to get the registration site set up and things, but literally within the next few days, I'd expect that would be there. So you'll be able to register for that one as well. So returning back to this evening, um, which as I say is an, another kind of a virtual tour, this time the Computer History Museum, Silicon Valley, California. So we travel still very much restricted in the physical world. Our speaker this evening, Dag Spicer, will transport you to sunny California. Dag Spicer leads the museum's collection strategy and supports multiple projects and initial initiatives across the institution, including those in research, education, fundraising, public programs and marketing. He is a longer service serving employee of the museum having started in 1996 and holds degrees in history, electrical engineering, and the history of science and technology. So with that, I'll hand over to Doug to take you to sunny California. Over to you, Doug. Thank you. Uh, let me just share my screen here. Thank you. Can everybody see the screen okay? We can see it, thank you, Doug. Okay, thank you. Well, welcome everyone, and thank you for inviting me into your into your evening tonight in South Wales chapter. I'm very delighted to uh, uh, give you a little tour of the Computer History Museum, which I hope some of you at least can come and visit someday. I know Paul has been and and speaks uh, had had a good time there. So we're going to take about a forty five minute or fifty minute. Uh, whirlwind tour through com the Computer History Museum. We'll start out with a bit of history, and then we'll look at some objects from our signature exhibition called Revolution, the first 2000 years of computer history. So the story begins in 1979, when Gordon Bell, who some of you may know, he was uh, kind of a famous computer engineer, father of the mini computer, and a vice president at Digital Equipment Corporation. He and Ken Olson, who was a co-founder of DEC, heard about the famous MIT Whirlwind computer being uh, sent on its way to the landfill. And so they actually uh, stopped the truck and asked it to turn around and deliver the Whirlwind computer system to Digital Equipment Corporation's uh, warehouses, where it stayed um, for a few years and became essentially the first object in the museum's collection, the MIT Whirlwind, which was a, an incredibly significant machine, a canonical machine in computer history, the one for which magnetic core memory was invented, for example. And uh, the follow-on to Whirlwind, known as Whirlwind II, became the well-known SAGE system, which we're gonna look at a little later, it's the Continental Air Defense System. In 1984, the museum moved from being a corporate uh, the corporate museum on the, on the DEC campus to a real standalone museum downtown in the heart of uh, Boston Harbor on the Museum Wharf. And there it was uh, sharing space with the Boston Children's Museum. So there was a lot of feed, uh, a lot of uh, 
uh, mutual support between the two institutions. What it did mean though, is that the museum, the computer museum's historical collection was often not seen and uh, in, in favor of sort of more user-friendly, child-friendly exhibits. And so it was decided in 1996 to make use of this historic collection, which at that time uh, was about 1200 objects and to move it west to a space that we found on an old uh, US, Navy Air, uh, US Navy base known as Moffett Field, uh, moderate Moffett Federal Airfield, which is an old Navy, Navy aviation base. And we moved there, we were set up in a bunch of Quonset huts and um, we moved our collection there and began the process of collecting artifacts on the West Coast. Another reason we moved to the West Coast, of course, was to make use of the greater funding opportunities um, that were, um, you know, as the center of technology moved from say Route 128, the traditional center of the mini computer industry to the microprocessor based industries, the shift in, in funding also moved from Boston to Silicon Valley. And so, so did we. In 2002, we purchased our beautiful home, which actually is a, a gorgeous uh, designed building, which used to be owned by Silicon Graphics. And Silicon Graphics, in fact, used to own about a dozen buildings in the, the, the general area where we are. Those are all now owned by Google, who looks at our building with, uh, with great interest as well. But uh, uh, the, <laughs> uh, they, uh, it's our building for now. So, and um, it finally in, uh, just a couple more slides on the history. 2007, we got a climate control storage facility. Over the course, if you remember in 96, we moved out west. By the time we hit today or 2020, we have 100,000 objects in the collection. And that includes artifacts, ephemera, movies, um, software. And so the collection itself has expanded by probably 30 or 40 times since we moved out west. 2008, the museum opens one of its, one of its uh, most popular exhibits ever. And that was the Babbage Difference Engine. And I want to thank, put it, say thank you to Doran Swade, who was really the, uh, the leader and the, the midwife of that whole, uh, the champion of that project, and uh, would not have happened without him. We fortunately had a local volunteer known as Tim Robinson, who was able to keep the machine, learned all about it. And in the tradition of Joseph Clement, Babbage's original mechanic, uh, he learned everything he could about the machine and was single-handedly uh, keeping the machine running because like a fine sports car, the Babbage engine kind of comes with a mechanic. It, it needs uh, some love and care and regular routine maintenance. 2011, the museum opened its major exhibit, which we're gonna spend the rest of the chat looking at, Revolution, the first 2000, years of computing. And that is a, a, a big milestone for the museum. It is designed for both self-guided and docent guided tours. There are over 1200 objects in the collection. And um, I think I saw uh, Jochen Wiehoff on the, on the list here. And I think he has actually spent the longest amount of time in our exhibit. I think he spent seven hours in there one time. So, um, that was really impressive. Anyway, maybe you can tell us about that later. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, I will. I will. I, I oh, will be open to the patient. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, in 2017, the museum opened our, our software exhibit. So uh, one of the critiques people often had was, oh, this is lovely, but it seems like there's a lot of hardware here. And in fact, if you, if you do read the labels, you'll see there's software interwoven with the whole, you know, all of the objects. But it seemed as though we needed to kind of uh, put a put a flag in the ground for software and really you know uh, really show the importance of it and so we came up with a, a new exhibit called Make Software Change the World that focuses on seven different um, canonical software packages like Photoshop, Wikipedia, um, World of Warcraft, the game, and there are three sections to each of those galleries: history, impact, and technology. So as you think about as we think about how we're gonna speak about objects, those are usually the three things we think about. What is the object's history? What was its impact? And then for the, what we lovingly call the propeller heads, such as, such as myself and many people in this call, uh, the technical part, 
So we want to know what the what the feeds and speeds are, for example, on on many of the uh, uh, of the objects. So let's take a look. And um, I just wanted to show you this is the final scene from the film Raiders of the Lost Ark. And uh, while we try not to lose things, be they arcs or in our case, adding machines, uh, warehouse space is always at a premium and enforces a certain discipline on curators. So knowing that space is always uh, hard fought for, we're very selective and uh, accept probably less than 30% of all offers um, that we get in a year. So um, that's that, let's have a look. So the first, uh, gallery that we're going to look at in Revolution is about the Abacus. And Revolution is actually one of 17 galleries. Don't worry, we're not going to stop in every one. Um, each one devoted to a certain theme or topic in computing, like punch cars or calculators or supercomputers uh, or analog computers. Those are all galleries that feature just that technology and, and objects related to it. Every, ob every artifact, uh, every gallery, I should say, also has a video station at which people can stand and watch and hear the inventors speak. So the narrative of the museum, of course, is the museum's narrative. We write the labels and so on. But if you want to hear the inventor's voice, and in many cases we have uh, long lost footage of uh, uh, rare footage of inventors speaking about their their uh, inventions available right in front of the very objects so people can, can get a multimedia experience there. So um, the Abacus is the first gallery that people see. It's actually called Calculators. And the Abacus is of course one, one of the, uh, um, the pretty, pretty much the first thing people see when they walk in. And we show uh, that this is an ancient device, it's really, of a class known as a counting frame. And it goes back even as far back to, so there were Sumerian Ab Abakai in 2500 BC, as well as Abakai in Egypt and Persia and uh, all over the, the Near and Middle East and as well as Asia. So if we take a little turn to the left here, so if you can see just off to the left, whoops, sorry. These are our aids to calculation. And here we show, uh, with the uh, ever-present gaze of famous uh, mathematicians through history, like Pascal and Leibniz and so forth, and Babbage, uh, just their eyes though, to kind of give it a little design element. Um, here you see uh, slide rules, linear and circular, uh, an interactive slide rule right in the middle there that uh, people can actually practice and understand how a slide rule works on their own. Very, you know, it's kind of an indestructible museum one. And, uh, as well, we have some uh, beautiful brass and glass uh, gunner's rules, sectors, compasses uh, from the 17th and even the 16th century uh, that people can see in the drawers underneath those. So uh, really going as far back as we can, this exhibit is meant to show, remember the first 2000 years of computing. So uh, we're going back as far as we can. Off to the right, you can see it as a curta, the famous, um, uh, me round, cylindrical mechanical calculator designed by Kurt, Kurt Herzak, a Holocaust survivor. Uh, there's a Pascaline there and Napier's Bones, an interactive off to the side far, the far right there where you can uh, figure, learn how to use Napier's Bones. Now here's a favorite, I think of Paul's, he really liked this one, the Antikythera mechanism. And uh, I don't know how many people have heard of this, but it's, it's actually rewriting the entire history of technology uh, because of this device, which is from basically the second century, uh, demonstrates or uh, it, it, within it shows technology that should not have been, uh, that was not discovered until the 1500s in Europe or perhaps a bit earlier. So the Antikythera mechanism is actually a, an eclipse prediction machine that uses a series of geared wheels that interrelate and follow um, ancient Babylonian star cycles in order to allow the user to predict um, the motions of the planets and when there when there'll be eclipses. So you think about the time when this was made, AD, uh, second century AD, it was made in the tradition of Archimedes, uh, actually. And so 
the weird thing is it's it's quite alien in its in its state of technological advancement as i said before we didn't see clocks or other mechanisms of this level of sophistication for another 1500 years so it really stands out as an oddity i should point out that um this was discovered initially in 1900 by greek sponge divers who went to a little island called Antikythera. There's an island called Kythera and another one called Antikythera. And as they were sponge diving there, the diver came back up gasping for breath and said there were all of these, there were all sorts of dead people on the bottom and dead horses. And, and he was very afraid. And initially people thought he had the nitrogen bends and he wasn't you know, in a proper frame of mind. They so went back down and saw a, uh, <laughs> basically one of the most important finds of classical statuary in history. Something like 40% of all existing classical Roman statuary comes from this one site, the Antikythera site, 36 marble statues of, of people like Julius Caesar and uh, uh, Archim uh, I, I'm sorry, I can't, yeah, Julius Caesar, and also um, uh, the, the other thing I wanted to point out is you can see this little station here in the middle. This is that video station that I was talking about where you can actually see and hear people talking about the, the mechanism. And uh, we actually had a custom movie made for us by the journal Nature, um, which describes the mechanism. It's how it works and uh, cites uh, world authorities on the mechanism and its history. It's still being decoded is sort of the honest truth. You can see the original in the archeological museum in Athens. And um, I think there are about 80 parts and uh, some of them are falling off. But um, this is probably why we say the first 2000 years of computer history, even though the abacus, the Sumerian abacus is older. We really had the Antikythera device in mind when we thought of the first 2000 years. Okay, punch cards. Punch cards, of course, were the mainstay of electronic digital computing throughout the 20th century. And it began with this modest machine uh, known as the 1890 census machine. This is a replica, by the way, I should be right up front about that, wooden replica built by the master craftsman Roberto Gotelli, who was actually built a lot of the models of Leonardo da Vinci for various world fairs and museums in the 60s and 70s. So he built this uh, for us. And you can see essentially the, how it works. You put a, um, the census taker goes out in the field and asks questions. It's then brought to a clerk who, if you look at the device on the left here, this is called a pantograph. The clerk then encodes the answers from the census taker as a series of holes in the pant using the pantograph. At that stage, the data is now machine readable. So that's a rather cosmic transition in the history of information processing to move from manual to machine readable computing. So the Hollerith machine was made to, uh, you basically put the punch card in this little press here, close the press and inside uh, uh, mapping every possible hole position of the punch card are discrete cups of mercury, the, as in the element mercury, the liquid metal mercury. On top of the little waffle iron press there are little rods that are connected to one side of a circuit. The cups of mercury are connected to the other side of a circuit. Where there's a hole, the rod goes through, contacts the cup of mercury, and kicks over the corresponding counter, which you see on the face of this machine, one position. So it's a tabulator. So at the end of the day, you just read your dials, and you've got the sum totals of all, uh, all your statistics. They were able to do the census in about three three years um, using this technology. And um, the previous census, the 1880 census had just been finished with months to spare. So they were, they really needed to automate and Herman Hollerith, a German American engineer and census uh, contractor uh, came up with this system. Hollerith's patents, of course, uh, became the basis for the IBM company, which started out as the com computing tabulating and recording company in 1911 and then changed its name in 1924 to the International Business Machines Corporation. So all of IBM's initial patents, sorry, not all, but most of IBM's in early important patents were Hollerith patents. In fact, 
as you may know, these punch cards were sometimes called Hallreth cards for that reason. Hallreth apparently got the idea from a couple of sources, it, uh, watching a train conductor punch out tickets, uh, which had a physical description of the people occupying the seat. So if the ticket, the little punched out ticket that the conductors uh, had punch said there should be a, an elderly woman here and there's a young boy, uh, you know, there's something amiss, someone's moving around the train or whatever. The other um, source is the Jacquard loom, of course, which used uh, uh, the Jacquard loom uh, add-on, which uh, was added on to existing looms to provide a punch card driven pattern generation mechanism. And uh, anyway, that's a long discursion on, the, on punch cards. One more on punch cards, which I want to bring up, is the Power Samus machine. And uh, I, I brought this out especially because this is an English audience or a, a Welsh audience as well. And um, I wanted to uh, point out that uh, this was a special project actually done by the Botanical Society of the British Isles to map all the flora of the British Isles. And so using citizen scientists in the best amateur tradition uh, who would go out and uh, fill out surveys of local flora. They encoded these in, in punch cards and then generated these maps. And we actually, you can buy the book on Amazon, the actual uh, Atlas as well. And that was all done in this particular one in 19, in the sixties uh, using equipment very similar to this. And uh, the Power Samas cards, of course, uh, these ones are only 40 columns, but Power Samas made cards in a multiple um, uh, formats up to even 130 columns. Uh, a little nerd moment if you're interested, the Power SMS machines use mechanical feelers while the IBM's uh, systems read their cards using electronic systems. Like I say, that's of only interest to the most diehard uh, gearheads. Okay, Enigma. I'm not going to speak much about Enigma because the people on this call are probably so much, so, uh, so much more uh, better acquainted uh, with the machine. But what I did want to do, uh, draw your attention to was the, just to the left of Enigma, you see a uh, pulley wheel. This pulley wheel, which came from uh, an English chap named Toby Harper, is said to have said to be one of the few or maybe the only remaining piece of a Colossus. And it's from the bed stand. If you see right beside here on the, uh, on the wall, we've blown up a picture of the bed stand that was used that ran the tape at, uh, I think it was 5,000 characters per second, something like that. Some, some incredible number of miles per hour uh, while it was uh, looking for matches. Now here is the King Kong of the, of the system that I really want to uh, get into for everyone, the Sage semi-automatic ground environment. So I probably most of you have not heard of this. And in fact, even most Americans uh, have not heard of this. It was um, a, an, a, an immense military project to create essentially a shield over, the, over North America, a defensive radar-based shield whose purpose was to detect incoming Soviet bombers coming over Greenland and uh, the Eastern seaboard and bombing, uh, dropping an atomic bomb on New York or Washington. Those are really kind of the threats. And so SAGE was made up of 23 blockhouses stationed across the United States and one in Canada in North Bay, Ontario, which is in fact where we got ours. It was the last running SAGE system in 1982. SAGE um, was built out of uh, two giant computers. Each, each blockhouse was had uh, a duplex computer, twin CPUs, uh, each with 30,000 vacuum tubes. So 60,000 vacuum tubes in total. The, the duplex CPUs actually were, was, a stroke, well, was a stroke of genius because the machine itself had a downtime of less than an hour a year, which is simply unheard of at, at this time uh, in terms of reliability and mean time to failure for a computer, uh, especially one using vacuum tubes. So a lot of preventive maintenance and a lot of love and care to keep the system running. Now, what you see on the right there is actually an operator station. And you might see just in front a little silver object that's called a light gun. And so an airman would sit in front of this screen with an air using this uh, light gun and wait for targets, which were basically the local radar picture of their sector was projected on their screen. 
all the known flights in the United States commercial aircraft system were punched in to SAGE. So it knew what was supposed to be in the sky and could therefore, by subtraction, tell you what was not supposed to be in the sky, the incoming, the scary Soviet the bombers. So uh, these, um, this workstation on the, on the right here was actually used uh, just dozens and dozens of these row upon row of airmen looking through. Um, there's actually a built-in cigarette lighter and ashtray in each of these. So it was quite a boring job um, as if there are any private pilots in the audience. Uh, I can think of the closest analogy to their job is what pilots sometimes experience, which is hours and hours of sheer boredom punctuated by moments of total terror. And uh, as they were waiting for these incoming bombers that never came, they did have some false alarms. For example, in one case, someone left a training tape on the system during a shift change, which you know moved the whole country to uh, an increased defense condition because it took a while to discover that. So anyway, SAGE actually cost more than the Manhattan Project. That's how big a system it was. And it was developed from basically 1956 or seven to about 1961. By 61, it was fully deployed across the United States. Um, the problem is that by the time it was all deployed, the Soviet Union and indeed the United States had developed ICBMs, the Intercontinental Ballistic Missile. Stage, unfortunately, could not keep up with something that fast. It was targeted it was meant to handle slow moving bombers. And so uh, essentially the system was, was rendered somewhat obsolete. Um, now in the case of all good uh, military systems, sometimes if the enemy doesn't know the limitations of your systems, it's safer to assume that it works. And in fact, that is sort of what seems to have happened. It happened again with Star Wars, uh, with Reagan, uh, which on a, a technical level was probably not possible. And some more milestones of SAGE. SAGE is actually the outgrowth of the whirlwind system from MIT. SAGE is whirlwind two. So that fantastic computer that we looked at initially, the one for, for which core memory was developed and essentially really the earliest electronic digital stored program uh, computer and uh, was, was the MIT SAGE, uh, sorry, MIT whirlwind of which SAGE is a direct progenitor. And um, what you see in front of you, just as we wrap this up, is actually probably less than 1% of the system. So uh, if you can think of 60,000 vacuum tubes and the space that would take. What you see on the left here is known as the shower stall. And it's actually a 16K kilo, kilobyte magnetic core memory for SAGE. So that gives you a size of an idea of how big 16K memory was. In, in the late 1950s, early 1960s. So the granddaddy of all mainframes for the 1960s, of course, was the IBM System 360, which IBM introduced in, on April 7th, 1964. That was just a few weeks actually before uh, Ford announced the Ford Mustang. So it was a good year for sort of classic American you know, technology. And uh, the big thing about the 360 was uh, it was actually a response to an internal crisis at IBM in which there were five or six or maybe even seven, depending on how you count them, mutually incompatible product lines. They, you know, they had punch card equipment with metal queen and legs and mixing in with like modern style, um, you know, tape drives. And it was just, the, the whole product line was kind of a mess. And unfortunately, IBM being a sales driven company, it created a crisis for the salesmen because they didn't know what machines to sell. And customers often called IBM asking for a computer and they get three or four different IBM salesmen calling them, trying to sell them a different system. So clearly IBM had to do something to resolve this internal crisis. And what they came up with, came up with was actually a family of systems known as the IBM System 360, which when it was introduced, when they finally shipped in 65, uh, came out in five different models spanning a 40 to one performance range. So everything from a small, um, you know, departmental type server to something big enough to handle an insurance company or a bank and, and several models in between. 
The great thing about IBM, uh, what I, I forgot to mention too, with these earlier computers, you had to write your own software, your own compilers, your own editors, your own everything. Every time, every time you bought new hardware, you had to rewrite all your own software. And it was only later on that manufacturers also, you know, eventually decided they should start providing software. You really had to roll your own in, the, in this is in the 50s. Uh, so when the 360 came out, um, it became uh, one of the, probably the most successful computer uh, architecture of all time. And I say that in, with some um, caution because I know there are a lot of architects, the x86 architecture is pretty, pretty, pretty powerful. But the fact is that um, in terms of the value of transactions processed by 360 code and the, these, the 600 billion lines of COBOL code that are legacy COBOL code that are still out there and that are running essentially 360 or 370 code, but on the latest Z series mainframes, that's an architecture that has stood the sense of the, the test of time, you know, a 60 year old architecture and it can still run essentially with a few modifications, much of the same software. And that was exactly their intent was to preserve customers investment in software. So you could move from the small low end model up to the, the high speed, high, you know, high expensive model. And essentially with, you know, it wasn't perfect, but you could essentially use the same software. And, um, uh, that was that just shook the industry, and of course, most of the people here probably know the expression "Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs," where IBM was Snow White had seventy plus percent market share, and the remaining six or seven uh, companies of Burroughs, NCR, Control Data, RCA, Honeywell, and so on, um, had to share the remaining twenty-five or thirty percent among themselves, and uh, um, they most, I think, almost all of them went under eventually trying to compete with IBM and in the mainframe sector. Um, this was just uh, to finish off, this was a huge gamble for IBM. Um, they essentially poured about $5 billion into it, this is 1964 dollars. At the time they were a $3 billion company. So that was really sticking their neck out. Uh, they went out into the market saying got financing and, and pulled it off. Okay, another amazing IBM product, the 1956 RAM Act, the Random Access Method of Accounting and Control. Now, the, the name RAM Act doesn't really, uh, it refers better to the system they built out of this, which was kind of an inventory control system. Um, but essentially, the RAM Act is the world's first hard drive. And I, I'm very careful with the F word, which, as we call it at the museum, the word first. Uh, because you're almost you're almost always wrong, uh, but in this case, uh, I really I can go out on a limb and say this is the world's first hard drive, and we have it. Um, it's composed of 50 24-inch uh, diameter discs um, coated with magnetic oxide and um, spin coated, and you can see on the left the um, uh, magnetic the uh, read the arm which goes up and down in and out with the read write head and uh, reads and writes data um, to RAMAC. Well, something that really may surprise you is we actually demonstrate this in 1956 technology. We demonstrate it every Wednesday at the museum or will again once we open up. And we actually found 45 year old customer data still sitting on, on some of the platters. So that was kind of interesting. We run the demo, uh, we control it with a laptop and you can actually, uh, we, we cycle through the, uh, the read, write to heads and uh, read and write to show how it moves up and down. And so this was basically the start of the entire hard drive industry. They still follow this basic technology, a spinning disc with a read, write head that moves across or in and out. And um, uh, this began IBM's long foray into mainframe, uh, hard disks, which they called, um, uh, oh, sorry, I'm blanking out on the name. Uh, sorry, DASD, uh, Direct Access Storage, Storage Device, D-A-S-D. Um, they didn't call them hard drives, they called them DASDs. So anyway, um, RAMAC was the start of IBM's dominance in the DASD space for, for the next two decades until, uh, smaller companies and the microcomputer uh, hard drives and mini computer hard drive companies started, started competing. 
This is one of my favorite computers. This is the Cray-1 supercomputer made in 1976 by American engineer Seymour Cray. There's a see-through. If you look at the bottom, you can see we put a see some see-through plexi on the, on the bench there. There's a circular bench around the computer, which is circular itself. If you look at it from the top on, it forms the letter C, which I guess is C for Cray. But there's actually a great technical reason for it being circular. And that is that all the wire lengths can be made shorter. If you think of the way it is right now in a circle, and then you, if you were to expand it into the usual linear square you know, cabinets side by side, all of a sudden all the wire lengths would get longer. And in a machine of this speed, uh, wire lengths matter. In fact, the machine is, every wire is cut within, to within about a 16th of an inch. They're essentially transmission lines. And uh, what you see on the bottom are the power supplies. The plus five, sorry, it's a minus five volt supply because this is ECL logic, comes in at 1200 amps. So that gives you a nice idea of how much power this took. And um, cost about 100,000 a month to operate in the 70s, 50,000 in air conditioning and electricity, um, and uh, 50,000 in, uh, in maintenance and uh, sundries. <laughs> what we have on the left here is actually really interesting. This is Seymour Cray's original notebook for the Cray one. And you can see, He's, he uses a very unique Boolean method. I'm sorry, I didn't zoom in on it, but um, he actually trained his staff to go right from Boolean logic diagrams to building circuits. There was no schematic. There are no schematics in a, in a Cray computer. Quite, quite remarkable. Um, now, of course, the Cray-1 was a legendary machine, not only for the, the size, uh, you know, its unique shape, but just for its raw speed, which, you know, computer engineers and architects at the time were just agog at the speed of this machine. They could not believe how uh, fast and, uh, you know, the, the, um, the connoisseurship that Seymour Cray showed. In, in the design and the, the balance of the system and how it's, how it's designed to work. The three largest applications for this system and indeed for most of uh, high performance slash supercomputing during this era, which is, is the Cold War. Um, without a Cold War, I don't know if, if, if Cray Computers or Cray Research would have been such a robustly uh, functioning company. And the three main applications during the Cold War for these supercomputers were essentially uh, cryptography, weather forecasting, and um, uh, sorry, just let me check my notes here. Oh, bomb design. Yes. So designing nuclear weapons. And so all the national labs uh, and the Department of Energy had, had Cray ones. And um, they made, I think, over 100 of them at about $10 million a piece. You also needed um, an existing mainframe to uh, connect to. So if you think about the math coprocessors that we used to have and with the 8087, the 287, the 387, the early x86 days, that's essentially what this is. It's a floating point coprocessor. Our next stop is the PDP-8, the classic, which you can see on the right here, <coughs> excuse me. And uh, um, on the left, I wanted to bring your attention to the, the little sign here. It says mini computers. And it was actually a DEC, a Digital Equipment Corporation sales person known as John Lenk, L-E-N-K from uh, Britain, who said uh, something about from the land of mini skirts and the Austin mini comes the mini computer. And so we thought we would do that. We showed a woman wearing a mini skirt and some kind of a go-go boot here uh, on top of a uh, PDP-8. The PDP-8 was, uh, you know, the word mini computer was was kind of new, and I think it did actually reflect cultural usage at the time. Um, people talked about mainframes, but that was that was about it. So um, they sold. This machine was really remarkable for a number of reasons. One, it cost less than twenty five thousand dollars, which was the discretionary budget for many departments, either at companies or universities. It was eighteen thousand five hundred dollars. That meant that all of a sudden a gigantic market of people could afford to buy these without having to go up the chain for authorization. It was still within this. And they did that very consciously to keep the price down. 
the reason they could keep the price down was the, among many reasons, was the use of this rather amazing computer controlled automated wire wrap machine called a Gardner Denver machine that did all the backplane wiring uh, automatically. So no longer were there no longer assemblers hired to wire wrap and uh, with all the errors inherent in that process and the bad connections and, and so forth. So they were actually, actually able to drive the cost way down. And at the time for, for an equivalent mini computer, you'd probably spend about $100,000. And so this at 18,500 was a, just a blockbuster. And what it allowed people to do is aside from using the, the mini computer as a tool for, you know, uh, scientific research or, or departmental computing that like you could do word processing on it and sort of rudimentary word processing on it um, was in process control actually. So building intelligence into factory processes was one of the early and most important applications of mini computers. And uh, in some cases, those mini computers, um, we just got offered uh, a mini computer, an old uh, Honeywell ProDAC uh, control system computer that was running a, a, a steel mill. It just came offline now. It was installed in 1973. And we're, we're they're offering it to us now. So that shows you the longevity of these, these systems. They're very robust. And um, we also have just off to the left, you can't quite see it, but we have uh, as another example of how you can build, sorry, how you can build intelligence into, uh, into objects using mini computers is we have actually a, um, a brain surgery cart just to the left. And that what it, it's showing essentially uh, PDP-8E performing a fast Fourier transform in real time of the EEG signal from the patient's brain. And the surgeons can use that as they, uh, as they operate di for diagnostic uh, purposes. Okay, I have to admit, this is one of my favorite photos. Uh, we have an exhibit on Moore's law, which we like to uh, show with this illuminated graph here that shows you the, the big, uh, uh, skyward trajectory of Moore's law. And um, we happen to have more Gordon Moore came by the museum one day and our, our staff photographer said, you know, would you mind uh, taking a picture for us? So we're pretty happy about this one. Uh, <laughs> Gordon Moore uh, published in 1964 in the journal of electronics, his first, um, didn't call it a law at the time, but you know, his first observation that uh, was actually related to the cost of integrated circuits, you know, the cost to produce them and the, the marginal extra cost, but um, people latched on to the transistor count. And so from then on, it's kind of been about the transistor count. And you think of the trillions of dollars in wealth that have been created from, um, generated by the technology behind this simple law. It really is remarkable. And, um, so we thought it deserved its own gallery. Just, you know, everything else is object-based, but this is actually, a, you know, a, a principle, an abstract, an abstract concept. And we thought it's so important. We need, we need to uh, call it out. So uh, actually this exhibit, which was finished 10 years ago, stops at 10 billion transistors. We're now at 35 billion. Uh, the new Xilinx uh, Vertex FPGAs are 35 billion. And in fact, there's a new wafer scale engine by a company called Cerebrus, which is like the whole wafer is the chip. They don't cut it out into little with a diamond saw and package it in little chips. The whole wafer is a chip. It has 2.6 trillion transistors, trillion transistors and uh, 850,000 CPU cores. So that's, that's quite something. The Xerox Park Alto, and I'm keeping an eye on the time here. I know we've, we've got to get going. Um, this is a remarkable machine as well that is the progenitor of so much we use today, including the computers we're watching this webinar on. Um, the Alto in 1972, keep that year in mind, 72, 74, thereabouts, had a graphical user interface, email, word processing, laser printing, ethernet, uh, uh, a bitmap display that uh, was meant to duplicate a sheet of paper, a removable disc, a three button mouse, painting and graphics program, a file manager, a chess games and pinball and a Star Trek game. All of this um, in this one machine 
done at the hothouse of Xerox Park with some of the smartest computer scientists in the country uh, came up with this machine. And of course, the legendary tale, which I'll be very careful how I cite it, but let's just say that um, Steve Jobs uh, saw this machine at Xerox Park and was uh, inspired to apply some of its principles, including hiring some of the people who worked on it to come over to Apple and, and work on the Lisa, which became the Mac. So uh, the Alto is really a, uh, an incredibly important machine that we, owe, we, we all owe our graphical user interfaces to that and to a couple of other machines, but it was the first one to really tie it all together. We have an Apple One computer, which is the very first product of uh, Apple computer, the Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak and Ronald Wayne, the third employee who people usually forget about. We actually got Woz to sign it for us. And uh, this came out in 1976. It was a single board computer, had a built-in, I think it was 4K basic. You could put in either a 6800 or a 6502 CPU, depending on what was cheaper at the time. And um, there, uh, they made about 200 of them. There's about, there are about 50 left. And part of the reason for that is that the Apple, when it came out for the Apple, when it came out with the Apple II, um, the follow-on product offered a trade-in on the Apple One, so those took out a bunch of them, in, took a bunch of them out of circulation, and they unfortunately probably tr trashed those. Tra 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 you may have seen the current prices for an Apple One; um, they've gone as high as a million dollars, which is unbelievable. The original price was six hundred and sixty-six dollars. So, um, because I think people see it as the sort of ur object of Apple, so it's sort of acquired this uh, mythic status. Now, um, based on the success of the Apple one, Steve Jobs said, well, what if we, um, what if we designed a computer for the, con the consumers rather than for, uh, you know, people who like to solder? And so that actually was, came out and was known as the Apple II, and which I, I won't show, but I think most of us know what that, what that looks like. Uh, and it came out in 1977, which is known as sort of the big bang in personal computing. Three machines came out that year, the TRS-80, the Apple II, and the Commodore PET, all came out within months of each other. Second to last object is the Google server rack. This is a really fun object. Uh, there's an electronics store here called Fry's, which is sadly, they just went under, uh, but they were sort of the go-to place for hobbyists and engineers in the valley to go pick up parts. Like if you needed a, you know, you, the joke was you could buy chips and potato chips at the same store. You know, you could buy a, a Z80 and a box of Pringles, a can of Pringles at the same place. Anyway, these go, uh, Google server racks here were designed by, uh, or built by the two Googlers, uh, Larry and Sergey, and their team who went to Fry's to buy a, what a, a, a bunch of what are called PC-104 format, um, personal computers. They're small, they're like maybe eight inches by eight inches square, uh, entire PCs on a little board. And so Google took a bunch of these, put them on a rack, put a very thin sheet of cork board, that is in cork as in a cork in a bottle, a wine bottle underneath each one. So the whole thing is really kind of a fire hazard. Nonetheless, uh, the thing worked that they have two network switches above which map out faulty nodes in the search uh, uh, in the in the array of per personal computers, and uh, the cool thing is, if you did a Google search in 1999 or 2000, it may have gone through this very rack. So that's something to think about. And our final object uh, is the interface, sorry, the interface message processor, which is um, the device that allowed uh, the first mainframe computers. Uh, to connect to each other on the ARPANET. So um, actually the concept of an interface computer was first proposed in 1966 by Donald Davies at, uh, at NPL to connect NPLs. Uh, as, as we have disparate mainframes in different locations, we need kind of a common box that can talk to another common box, which in turn will talk to the the, the uh, custom hardware on both ends. And that was the IMP. Essentially, it's a gateway or what we call now a router. It's uh, built like a battleship. And um, 
Again, some of the very earliest internet or an ARPANET communications went through this. It was built by Bolt, Baranek and Newman, a firm in, in Boston, and it has inside a um, hardened Honeywell 516 mini computer. So again, the mini computer running, uh, being used as a, as a host sort of, or I should watch what I'm, um, use the word host, but uh, as, as an interface, a way to connect different hosts to each other. Now let's just wrap up and look at the future. Um, the museum going forward is, is going full on digital as well as uh, keeping all our beautiful, uh, wonderful objects, of course, in the historical collection. But what, we want, what we're trying to do now is really um, step up our IT uh, systems and the way they work and specifically the way it would affect you in the outside world is to create what we call essentially an API to our collection. So what we're calling Open CHM is to make our historical collection and archives more visible and accessible to a global audience. And so we're going to build some hooks and APIs for people to share content uh, and pull content directly from our collection and use it in whatever ways they want. And that'll also allow us to share uh, and compare collections across institutions if, as what we're hoping will happen, um, the technology that we're developing with. Torrentia, a company in Toronto, and Microsoft is a combination of digital asset manager and collection management system. And we're going to develop that internally and then release it to the world so everyone can use it if they want. Now, I know it's a big uh, changing your museum database system is a big deal. So it's not for not for everyone, but we're trying to contribute to the discipline um, of uh, you know, making this, making our collections more obvious to the world. It's really what it's all about. It doesn't do any, any good if it just all sits in a warehouse. So um, just a final call, please visit us. I would love to uh, personally show any BCS members, uh, give you a personal tour and show you around the museum. And um, we can stop and have a coffee or a tea and talk about computer history. There's so much more. And um, we've just taken a really whirlwind guide through the through the place and uh, I hope you enjoyed it and I look forward to your questions. Okay, thank you, Doug. Um, if you just give me a moment or two to fiddle um, yeah. so that we can um, highlight a, a few people. Should I go um, off screen share? If you go off screen share whilst I'm, I'm fiddling with this, um, then... Okay. That uh, looks pretty good. Uh, where are we? If I if I pin me, uh, we should be okay. I nearly put myself in the waiting room. That would never have done. <laughs> How would you get out? <laughs> yeah, this is a good question, isn't it? Um, okay. Uh, that's the wrong one to pin. So what we'll try and do is to look, uh, look competent. Uh, if Paul and John could, uh, I can see John's there. So we'll spotlight John as well. So what I'm doing is I'm just bringing in um, for everyone um, the panel. Um, so basically, um, the organizers and what we'll do then is to look after uh, if I can find myself um, we'll look after the, the Q and A um, okay so I'll stop faffing around um, it'll have to do with me as a, a bit of a disembodied voice um, so first question um, is could you say something Dag um, about your archives and what's lurking in, in your um, Raiders of the Lost Ark stores? Well, yeah. Okay, so first the archives. Um, take the Empire State Building, double it in height. That's, that's the size of our archives. It's twice the height of the Empire State Building. So I think it's like two, no, it's not two miles. It's like over a mile, a mile and a bit of archives. So Essentially, um, we have uh, personal papers, but also we're very strong in corporate uh, company and manuals. Uh, we work with one of our or one of our curators who runs the Bitsavers Archive, 
which is actually mirrored by the Library of Congress and has been called a national, uh, declared a, a website of national uh, merit or you know uh, value. And so uh, there you can find uh, Al's 30 year career of scanning manuals. And there's, there's millions of pages of manuals all online. And so that's part of the archive as well, but it's uh, mainly a paper archive. That is sort of the reference standard that we're trying to you know, adhere to. In a digital world, we'd like to have the, the original paper if possible. As to the um, materials in stores, so in Revolution with 1200 objects, that's essentially 1%, maybe less uh, of the collection. So you've got 98 plus percent of the collection is in stores at any one time. And uh, that's kind of the way it is with, with museums. And uh, we try to come up with new exhibits so that we can sort of, you know, have a rotation of objects that keep and, and interesting themes that, that keep these objects in circulation. We also loan objects to other institutions as well. Some of the uh, more interesting things, I guess we have, um, let me see, uh, complete IBM 704. And I mean complete, uh, you know, it's about 14 cabinets or something. Uh, a complete IBM stretch, which is about 23 cabinets. Uh, you know, this is a one computer, 2000 square feet uh, kind of scale of things. And uh, all sorts of supercomputers, uh, Cray C90s, uh, um, just trying to mentally go through the warehouse, you know, there's so much and it's just stacked up on, on high shelves. You don't get to see a lot of what's there, but the database is kind of the best way to explore, explore what's there. If, if you were to go, um, and you know, I could I could point out a few kind of interesting objects, but mostly it's kind of closed and things are wrapped up and in boxes and sealed. And so, yeah, it's it's maybe not as exciting as as you think. Okay, um, we're doing quite well for questions. Um, this one might be a bit of a kind of a, a question for everybody. Um, what was the last known company or organization actively using the old style mainframes with reel to reel tape storage? I have to say there's kind of a hint of nostalgia, I think, in that. Uh, I imagine the government, the US government is still reel to reel though. Uh, I know they're using eight inch floppies still mm -hmm. in some of the ICBM uh, sites, strangely enough, like as we yeah. just mentioned earlier. <laughs> I, I really don't know. I know the IRS, uh, the NSA has ancient, uh, apparently as a computer museum of its own where it keeps old hardware. Um, not sure if there's really any, any use for it anymore though. Uh, the, now, if you wanna actually see running hardware, you can come to the computer museum where we have a running IBM 1401 computer system. That's from 1959. It's a punch card based uh, small office system that features a card reader punch, uh, a printer, and a CPU. And those three elements make up this uh, computer. And by 1965 or 66, in fact, the IBM 1401 was basically the most popular computer system in the world. The 360 was still coming on. And so the 1401 was very important as a transitional machine for from removing people, for moving people from the punch uh, from the control panel paradigm of programming to uh, stored program computing. So moving from the old plug board programming with the wires to actually using software. That's what the 1401, that was a sort of its purpose in the IBM product line. Well, John and, and Paul, have you come across anybody still using technology of that vintage for real work? No. No, I'm afraid not. No. No, but I'd love to. I think uh, this is where you have to get into military or nuclear power stations. And of course, the world is far bigger than, than just simply uh, Western Europe and the United States. Mm. So who knows what treasures lie in Eastern Europe and, and of course, uh, maybe uh, in, in Africa and so on. It's, I actually uh, have a what I call an empire theory of computer history, which is that a, a lot of times at the at the outposts of empire, whatever that empire is, the British Empire, you know, whatever, um, 
South America, uh, sort of, you know, on the, at the periphery, uh, you find this is, this is often a good sore old vintage hardware, you know, th that it's still there even. Uh, I had a guy who worked on ENIAC come in three years ago and say, I have all the original drawings for ENIAC. Would you like them? <laughs> He's 95. <laughs> and, um, you know, that kind of thing happens at the museum every once in a while. It just really makes your day to think that history is uh, just, I guess my main point is history is so alive and is always being rediscovered, reinterpreted as, you know, added to and subtracted to a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, um, we've had a little comment from Ross Hanna, um, who says that Sandia National Lab still uses reel-to-reel -reel storage for old test data and, and for recording new data. Mm. So that's kind of interesting. Um, I remember when I last came across and, and used them, which was in the very early 90s, but then I kind of moved away from mainframes to... Um, mini computers and, and personal computers in a kind of professional capacity. Um, but I do remember much more recently than them, um, we had a, a, a talk about how um, seaports, shipping ports um, are organised and the computery behind them. Um, there is a control centre for the whole of the um, the, the, the Bristol Channel, the Seven Estuary, um, in in Cardiff, and we went to to visit that, um, oh, and that yeah. was memorable because um, there was a ship locking through um, the, the the lock that led out to sea, and half our audience were on the wrong side of the lock when it opened, so we had to wait <laughs> quite a long time. Um, <laughs> but they told of the fact that um, a a huge container port on the south coast of England um, was still run off old ICL hardware and it was one of the few sites left running it and, and they were simply worried about spare parts um, because what they had to do was to beg, borrow and steal spare parts off other sites um, uh, other organisations that, that may have had the odd bit that was useful um, left so you can stretch the longevity of this old hardware um, in real, real sort of business use as well as in, in museums, but for business use, it must be edge of the street, edge of the seat stuff. So, in relation to the uh, the previous question, um, could it be possible? Um, oh, now, this was a different previous question. Um, let me scroll back a little bit if I can. Um, yeah, is there a way in which we can read more about your database proposals um, or sign up for news updates? I got excited by the idea that we might all collectively be able to contribute to a grand collection um, of all historic objects related to the history of computer. I don't need to read this anymore, Dag, do I? Um, you're on the <laughs> ball here. Um, this guy well, has a yes. museum in his own yep. house. Oh, wonderful. Well, I think... Um, uh, what was I going to say? I'm sorry. I think I lost my, my train of thought. Uh, uh, can I ask the question one more time, please? Okay. Is there any way which we can either contribute oh. or sign up for information about your new yes. kind of database? Open. Got it. Oh, open CHM. Got it. Got it. Uh, I'd be happy if you just send me your email or, or I can send you mine uh, just to put you. There's no formal list. Um, but I'd be happy to send you updates as we get them. Uh, we get at least quarterly updates from the IT to you know IT people, and um, I, I would love to do that. And you know, um, librarians have been all over this for a long, uh, many years. They called it a union catalog, which is where you have, you know, that you think of the, the 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 logical operator of union versus intersection, and uh, so it's a union of multiple libraries collections. And that's, they produce this big, massive catalog as a result. That's maybe kind of what we're not really thinking of. Like, we kind of joke, we call it one ring to bind them, you know, like <laughs> Lord, of, Lord, Lord of the Rings. It's kind of like a, a way to get everybody sort of collecting the same data and, you know, using the same approaches and, you know, if they make sense. And um, that that's really our goal. So I'd be happy to keep you in touch if you just... Uh, uh, send me your email or uh, get in touch with me somehow. I'll be doing that. Yeah, okay. Um, so if you email 
Um, let me think. There's some um, email addresses, I think, for committee members for the South Wales branch of BCS on the uh, pages of the BCS website. Just drop one of us a, a line there if you prefer not to put your um, email address in, in the chat. Um, so the... I don't, I don't mind. I, would you like me to? I'll do it right now. Yeah, yeah if no you problem. could put that in the, 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 the chat, yeah. Um, so Absolutely. in relation to that question, um, is it possible um, for people to actually contribute to the online collection uh, in, in the same sort of way that um, one might with Wikipedia? Um, well, we do have a, do you have in mind, are they digital objects or uh, physical objects? Any idea? Um, we, digital, I guess, since the reference there is to, uh, to, to Wikipedia um, and either sort of contributing original digital documents or simply typing oh, yeah. in um, your contribution. Yeah, no, we definitely do have, uh, we have a digital archivist actually who does nothing but uh, handles that kind of stuff. And um, we're very much, uh, very much interested in that, uh, making sure that our, uh, our archives are, are accessible. Okay, so again, uh, ideas, thoughts, contributions to Doug's email address. Um, do you have a minimum age for acquisitions? Ah, how soon do things become interesting? Uh, this is this is really fun. We have a bit of a. It's not really a debate at this point, but we we have kind of a rule at the museum. It's called the ten year rule, and that's exactly gets ex at exactly what you're saying, which is. We try to wait 10 years before we accept an object, and that's really just to gain historical perspective. Um, as you know, things change so fast, and uh, you know it's just too hard to assess. In many cases, not all cases, but in, in most cases, it's too hard to assess the true historical value and impact of something just you know a year after it came out or even like three years after it came out we like to wait 10 years we, we do make exceptions so for example when the iphone came out and the, and the ipod came out we got those immediately we just said this is obviously a category and, and both of those are category defining uh, new category defining products and so we should have them they're new platforms yeah. the, the iphone is a new computing platform so uh so we do make exceptions, but that's kind of the general rule. We, we like to wait 10 years. Okay. Um, where are we? Um, somebody's, Bob has uh, commented that it's not a question, but um, he's found your online virtual tour of Revolution really impressive. Um, when we were chatting and rehearsing the other evening, you, you actually gave us a quick whirlwind of that. <laughs> Didn't quite work so well on... Um, on Zoom, yeah. Um, but what we agreed we would do then is to um, add a few um, carefully chosen links that you send us um, to the event page on the, the BCS website. And one of the things we we're going to do there is the online virtual tour. Um, it's it was something. It was like um, Google helped you with it. Um, Google Street View type. Street, thing. Street, yeah. Street yeah. View. Yeah. Um, so that's well worth it. So um, what we will probably be able to do is to email um, folk that have booked. Um, the headquarters maintains a list of people who booked. And so we can target them, um, specifically send you um, a, a note that the web page has been updated. Um, so we'll update the web page with um, the links you send us with the presentation that you've been through for us. So we'll PDF that and pop it up. Um, and um, if kind of I can kind of deal with the technology of getting the kind of video recording through to headquarters for um, for editing, then that will go onto YouTube in about a month, I think is their turnaround time. Okay. Um, Right. Okay. Next question from Jochen Wiehoff, who you chatted with earlier on. Um, is the Xerox Alto in your exhibition, the one <clears throat> which was restored some time ago <clears throat> and is in operational status? That one I don't believe is, is functioning. The one we got running, which we had a, an actually a historical event based around a running Alto where we got Charles Simoni and uh, other early programmers 
uh, who worked at Xerox Park to actually demonstrate their original software. So Simone did Bravo, for example, their word processor for the Alto. And you know, it was really interesting having these original creators run their software on original hardware. I have to say it was pretty daunting for some of them. They, you know, they're saying, this is 40 years. I haven't looked at this code and, <laughs> or, you know, I haven't sat in front of this application in 40 years. It's, it's really, so we worked through all that and it, it turned out very well. So the short answer is uh, not 100% sure on, on whether the one on display is functional, um, but it's complete and un undoubtedly could be made functional. Uh, but we do have a functional one as well that we use in our software. Um, software history center which is uh where we do all our history our software preservation yeah yeah i i remember as um uh, somebody in in their kind of school years watching the apollo moon landings and the, the watching live the first moonwalk um and then a year or so binge watching um the series of youtube videos on the the restoration um of the uh, an Apollo, a real Apollo guidance computer, um, mm. to the point at which they would actually run the original software um, and pretend to land on, on the moon. Um, that was a stunning example of, of, of what can be done by people who are madly dedicated. Yes, we have actually, uh, uh, what's his last name, Mike? His first name is Mike. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, he's literally a rocket scientist. And yeah. he works in Palo Alto and he's on our team and he did the one, he read all our Apollo guidance computer, rope memory. Rope memory, by the way, is a form of, it's kind of like magnetic core memory, but it's a ROM, it's a read-only memory. So the, the cores are actually hardwired. Uh, they're not changeable. Yeah, well, if I ever make it over to the Computer History Museum, I'm going to start stand in front of the display of, of that and just kind of spend hours kind of binge watching the, the, the real thing. Um, oh, next great. Next, next question up. Um, that and drinking coffee. But um, the next question up is: is is what do you consider to be your number one object? Um, this is one of those. If you could only choose one thing, what would it be? Questions. Ah, uh, yes, the Sophie's Choice question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, in, I've often said this uh, because I've been asked this before, and I'll, <laughs> I'll say I think it's Enigma. And it's not even a computer, it's basically a flashlight circuit. But uh, the thing is, in terms of its impact on human history, I'm not sure there's anything else in that on display that has quite the same gravitas and, and importance historically. That's just, you know, the Cray one is okay. pretty nice too, I gotta say. Yeah. I like the yeah. Cray one. We've had a couple of questions which kind of pick up on that theme. Um, and they, they kind of turn the question around and ask, what would you really like to add to your collection? What are your gaps? Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful question. You know, we used to have a wish list and now we, uh, we took it down, but uh, well, probably a system 370 would be nice. Mm -hmm. We have some control panels, but you know, uh, Unfortunately, because IBM's business model was essentially leasing machines, um, a lot of them, when they came off lease, they would go into like a secondary or even tertiary leasing market. There was a company called Com Disco, for example, that was really very famous that did that. And then, but at some point, they're scrapped, and you know they don't. Nobody offers them to museums, and uh, that's the sad fate of most mainframes. And uh, we we got ours through kind of a fluke. Our our system three hundred and sixty. Okay, well, I think there's just one more question, um, which might be a yes or no answer, I guess. Do you have the lunar landing program for the deck GT40 in your museum? Oh, nice. Hmm. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, I, I'd be happy to look into that if they want to send me their... Oh yeah, I see. Oh, Paul, Paul it, said it, that. It's, it's me. <laughs> oh, I, okay, Paul. I'll, I'll I, 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 I used, to, used to play play with that along with many other people when we had a GT40 in the R&D lab I worked in, and that was a, 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 a lunchtime attraction. And I just wondered when we started talking about the Apollo, whether you actually oh. had that bit of software, because I, I noticed you had the GT40 there. Yeah, 
Yes, yes. In fact, that program has got to be the most popular program on the GT40, I'm sure. The lunar lander. (laughs) Anyway, I'll look into it for you, Paul, and uh, get back to you. Brilliant. Well, I, th- I think that uh, out of a very extensive chat, I've, I've picked out the um, the questions. There was a lot of information in there from people um, that kind of real found a real resonance with what you were saying. Um, so there were lots of people who were saying, you know, I've got a PDB something or other in the garage. The roof leaks a bit, but it's still a that, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. So I'll 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 carefully preserve and anonymize that and, and, and share that with you later on. Um, yes, sure. I'd be but, happy to answer. Um, I, I think now what I need to do is to hand over to John Tucker. Okay, well, it falls to me to give you a vote of thanks, Doug, and I want to thank you sincerely for giving the time uh, and, and, and coming to talk to this branch. Your museum is, of course, of world class, but it's also of course, the result of, of, I calculated, 42 years since an essentially impulsive act uh, by deck executives to rescue <laughs> the machine to, to, to the glories we're hearing about today. Since you've been working for them since 96, you must be terribly proud to see how the museum has, has progressed uh, and, and what a beacon it is, uh, a terrific place. And, like Paul, I've visited your museum and uh, uh, will never forget it and will certainly return when I can. But, so thank you for your time. You've talked so wonderfully about some iconic machines, adding all sorts of interesting tidbits about these machines. Uh, and uh, I can add a few tidbits myself because since this is the South Wales branch, the urge to make some sort of bridge and mm-hmm. one bridge I can make is with the Antikythera mechanism. Because uh, th- this device, which has been uh, more and more in evidence in, uh, in ancient Greek history in, in, the, in the last few decades, uh, and the museums, of course, uh, took a great step forward because of a professor of astronomy called Mike Edmonds at Cardiff University, which is just uh, 40, 40 miles down in the eastern direction from where I am in Swansea. And uh, he did a lot of important imaging and was able to confirm the most incredibly subtle calculations uh, by Michael Wright, the curator at the Science Museum. Ah, uh, yes. who spent many years doing detective work, but thanks to the endless ability to see through walls and read things that we were never meant to read by devices that was made progress. And so that was wonderful. I, I, I thoroughly loved anything to do with Power Samos because it, it reminds us of how much we calculated, how much we love data through the whole of the 19th century and, and how it has changed our thinking about ourselves and our societies. So when the electronic computer comes along, of course, not only do we have to catch up in, uh, but we also, of course, start to create absolutely new, new resources. I think the SAGE system is intriguing. And of course, so much rests on military development in times of stress and conflict, as indeed, I, I dare say, it, it does while well. we're having our lecture tonight. We had a cray in Swansea, it wasn't a cray one. Uh, the d- department budget never managed the $10 million mark. We also had a PDB-8, which by a miracle, we did actually get get uh, get one of those. So these machines live, I think, in the minds of many people. And through your talk, we were reminded of all the different developments, all the extraordinary physical and technological uh, breakthroughs that have gone on and and, and how much we owe to the dedicated ingenuity of engineers. So thank you very much for this. And oh, thank you, John, it was a pleasure. Great, and I, I trust that the 61 people who attended your lecture at the height and uh, will register this and, and look forward one day to visiting um, the San Francisco area and coming to Mountain View and well worth doing that. Let me just draw one more attention, and that is that our history lectures, which Paul and 
and Jeremy have systematically supported now for 10 years um, uh, is a great pleasure for the South Wales branch to, to have, and we usually uh, learn a great deal. And I just want to draw attention to the fact that the very first one was when Swansea University decided that it would put its head above the parapet and create its own history of computing collection. And, and we have some very interesting and unusual archives, but most of the machinery we've got is exactly the same story as those deck engineers. It, it all looked as if we had to move. So do you resign or do you suddenly reconceptualize these cupboards and call it a collection, which is what we did. And we've been rewarded with some beautiful rooms now with study spaces and all kinds of lavish coffee machines for people to come. And so if you have got a rusting PDP-8 in your garage, um, think of us at Swansea University because we're not proud, <laughs> we'll take anything. And uh, I haven't yet succumbed to the idea of buying Mac products and not opening the box in order to preserve them in a pristine state, which could be an interesting exercise. One last thing I might say is that I noticed that Doran Swade was with us this, this evening and that was great. And I wanted to mention that Doran is giving a talk on the historiography of the history of computing to the BCS, uh, Computer Conservation Society in May. You can find it on the website if you're looking for it. And I want to welcome all sorts of other people that I've noticed in the participants, especially Gibson from Malawi, who is writing about the history of computing in Malawi and was with us this evening. So uh, an unusual but wonderful evening. Thank you so much. My pleasure, John. Thank you for those lovely words.